All right, guys. I know you're all way more excited to see my presentation than to see the movie tonight, so I promise to go like three hours long. You ever good with that? Just kidding. Uh, one disclaimer on this presentation, uh, Dustin Campbell was doing a presentation at Build today on the same thing. So there's like a 20% chance that there are things that I'm gonna show today that are obsolete, and I apologize. Um, but, but you know, what can you do? What we're gonna be talking about in here is Project Roslyn, and specifically how you can analyze code with Project Roslyn. Roslyn is Microsoft's next generation compiler technology, which on the face of it is not terribly interesting, but the fact that we have an API into the compiler enables some really fascinating scenarios. Roslyn allows us to get in and do things with the code, to the code, and for the code that we just couldn't do easily before. And now uh, it's actually kind of simple con uh, con uh, considering what you can do. So just as a show of hands, how many people have played with the Roslyn SDK at all? Okay. So most of you are new to it, which is good because we're gonna start uh, at a pretty basic level. Um, how many of you have ever tried to write a parser before? for a compiler. Was that fun? <laughs> was, it, was it easy? No. So a lot of the things that we want to do to be able to understand uh, our code, and specifically in this case our C-sharp code, um, requires that would re right now, before Project Roslyn, would require us to write our own parser. That's what ReSharper did, the way that ReSharper does all the things they do is they have their own compiler pipeline. But we don't want to do that. It's way too much work. We've got websites to write. And so what we want is for Microsoft to give us the tools to do that easily. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Just a little bit about me. Uh, I am Eric Potter. I work for Aptera Software. We have offices in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is where I work, uh, and then also in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, which is a cool little town. I've been writing software for about 13 years professionally, much longer than that, um, just as a hobby. As a side gig, I teach as an adjunct professor at Indiana Tech, which is there in Fort Wayne. I bring this up because I've used this with my students before. With a little bit of help understanding the API, I've had sophomore and junior students at Indiana Tech writing analyzers, uh, doing analysis on code. And they were able to get pretty far with that, which I think says a lot about Roslyn and the, the API. I mean, it's pretty understandable. It's pretty approachable. This is not something that uh, would completely confound my students, which things like tying shoes and showering sometimes confounded them. So the fact that they understood Rosalind says a lot. One of the projects that I did with my students was uh, in an object-oriented design class, we had them, or I had them write some very simple analysis tools to analyze how object-oriented their code was. You know, as a general principle, if you write a class, it should have multiple methods, and if any one of those methods is more than 40 lines long, you probably aren't understanding how objects should be designed. And so they had an assignment that lasted several weeks to use Roslyn to pick apart c -sharp files and analyze the class and see how many methods there were and see how long those methods were or how deep the nesting was. What was interesting was that, as you would expect with a bell curve, there were some students that got the assignment to work and also had really well-structured code. I had some students that had neither, never got it to work, never came to class, 
If they had code, it wasn't any good. You'd expect that. But then there were some students in the middle that got it to work, but you know they had the entire application in a single method that was 300 lines long. Um, and since it was an object-oriented design class, I really frowned upon this. But what was fun was at the end, I'm like, hey, hey, come look at this. Hey, your, your program works. And so I ran your program against your own source code, or in this case, its own source code. You know what it's telling you? It's telling you that its source code is bad. <laughs> your code is so bad, it's telling you it's bad. Some of them thought it was funny. One of them dropped the class. Uh, that's all right. So let's talk about what, uh, what Rosalind is. Like I said, in general, Rosalind is just a compiler. Actually, it's two compilers. Right now, it's the C Sharp compiler and the VB compiler. And we've had a C Sharp compiler for, I don't know, 15 years now. It's called csc.exe. It's on your Windows machine if you have Visual Studio installed. And like most compilers that you've ever used, it follows this standard diagram, right? You take source code, you put it in one side, magic happens, and an executable comes out the other side. And it's this giant black box. You don't know what happens. Um, I had one laptop, I think a gerbil was actually involved in the process somewhere. But like most compilers, it would start by parsing, and then it would you know, generate the lexical information and generate symbols. And then it would bind everything up, and then it would have a part of the process at the end that emitted the executable. What makes Rosalind interesting is that we now have an API on this entire process. So while it's doing the parsing, or rather when the parsing is done, we have an API into the syntax tree. And this isn't some data structure that kind of represents what the compiler is doing. It actually will, will return the full fidelity abstract syntax tree that the compiler itself is using. And when I say the compiler, I mean as of Visual Studio 2015, the compiler that Visual Studio is gonna use. So this is the compiler that you should care about. And now you have access to its internals. And then once we've generated all the symbols and once we've bound, uh, gone through the binding, we can use and get at that information. And there is a piece at the end uh, where we actually can alter how the IL is emitted. Now, I will say there, the Roslyn API is really big. There are big pieces of it. It's a big project, and today we're just gonna focus on some of the code analysis pieces. Um, so if you have questions about the emit API or the scripting API, I, I'm not an expert on those by any sense of the word. Like I said, you can use it for C Sharp and VB. Um, when they first announced it, they were referring to it as a compiler as a service, which was an okay term depending on how you thought of a service. A lot of people were confused and thought that meant that it was gonna be the compiler in the cloud, uh, which Microsoft does have now with Visual Studio Online and Monaco and those things, which is awesome. And Roslyn is used in that, but that's a different thing. When we say it's a compiler as a service, we just mean it's a compiler that we have an API to. One of the other pieces of uh, Roslyn is the scripting API, which allows us to execute uh, code in different ways. How many of you guys have ever used script CS? Okay. I'm gonna, how many of you guys have heard of script CS? Okay, so a few more people. Script CS is this really cool tool that allows us to execute C sharp code in a read eval print loop or execute C sharp code as scripts. So if I'm at the console, and I say script CS, I'll drop into a read eval print loop or a REPL. These are really common in the Node.js communities and in the Ruby community and in the Python community. 
But I can just drop in here and say console.writeline. And then it will compile, and then I get my output. So I can have C-sharp code without needing the ceremony of uh, opening Visual Studio and creating a solution and creating a project and declaring a namespace and declaring a class. Um, what the compiler is doing behind the scenes, what ScriptCS and Roslyn are doing, is they are actually generating a class uh, for us, but they're just wrapping it so we don't have to worry about it. So I can say things like var pi equals 22 over seven. And it's creating a variable named pi for me and instantiating it. If I inspect the value of pi here, what, what result am I gonna get? What value will be returned? Okay, so I'm hearing two answers, 3.17 and three, uh, which is kind of normal. It's three. Why is it three? It's integer arithmetic, right? Because this is not just some scripting language, this is C-sharp. This follows all the rules of C-sharp that we know and love. Uh, if I left the semicolon off, uh, well, it would say the expression is not complete. Um, but it would otherwise give me an error. Script CS is really useful for a couple things. One of them is that I can write script files, so I don't have to type it all in. I could actually enter all the code in a CSX file and execute it that way. So for some scripting tasks, it's really nice. Um, but the other thing is that on every developer laptop I've had, I've had like, 30 projects somewhere that were like console application one, console application two, console application 17. Because there's always these little bits of C-sharp code that I wanna test out. And so one of the things that ScriptCS allows me to do that I love is to drop into uh, the console and test that out. So I bring that up because ScriptCS uses Roslyn to generate the executable behind the scenes. You could see at one point there was kind of a noticeable lag, and that's because it's taking what I typed into uh, the console and actually compiling it. Now the other notable place that Roslyn is being used is in the new ASP.NET stuff, or in ASP.NET v Next. One of the features is that there's no longer going to be this dedicated compile step. So if I edit some code in my web API, uh, and then fire up the browser, it'll work. And that's because there is a file system watcher that noticed that I changed some C-sharp code and it recompiled it for me. And so if I just jump to the browser, it'll work the way I expect it to. Another awesome thing about Rosalind is that it's now totally open source. You know, Microsoft has gone through this big paradigm shift in the last couple of years where they're now really embracing open source. There was a time at Microsoft when it was a really big deal that they shipped Visual Studio with jQuery in it. And now the actual compiler is open source. Uh, it's actually kind of fun to download the project and see how the guys on the Visual Studio, or on the C-sharp team write C-sharp. So you can go up to GitHub and see commits by guys like Eric Lippert and Anders Hausberg, and I don't know, it amuses me. But it's also very, uh, you know, it's just, it's good that it's out there. This would lead to the possibility of you having your own specific syntax on Roslyn or in C Sharp. Um, if you're familiar with some of the other languages like Elixir, they have key, a keyword called unless. And that's basically a syntax sugar for if not. And so if you wanted to add the unless keyword to C Sharp, you could. Uh, and you could compile a C-sharp compiler and it would work. You could do that. It'd be a terrible idea, but you could do it. Um, if you did that, you'd obviously have code that only compiled for your compiler and you know, it wouldn't be cross, you, know, you couldn't like share with other people and people that are new to the team would be super confused. But you know, you could do it. 
You could also teach yourself to ride a unicycle. It'd be neat. I don't know why you would. So there's several layers to the API that are worth talking about. Um, the compiler APIs are the ones we'll generally look at today. And that's where we're going to do things like get at the syntax trees, and we'll look at the symbols. If you wanted to, you could get in and do binding and flow analysis. So look for things like, are there methods that are never called? And are there variables that are never used? One level above that, there is the workspace API that deals with things like the entire Visual Studio solution or the entire Visual Studio project. And if we could use that to do some code formatting or uh, we could find all references or go to definition, things like that. And then at the highest level of the APIs, uh, we could do things like refactorings and code fixes. It's worth noting that the feature APIs actually have to run in Visual Studio to work. The workspace APIs and the compiler APIs could work in your application. There are DLLs that you could include in your project and do these things. It's also worth noting that Microsoft has said that they will not have like secret backdoor APIs into this. So if Visual Studio can do it, you can do it. The same method call that Visual Studio uses to find all references will be available to you. Um, and this code fixes idea, this is kind of where we're gonna end up today looking at how we do the diagnostics and code fixes. So we'll definitely come back to that. So let's say we wanna play with Roslyn. There are three ways we can get started. Uh, you can install the Roslyn SDK, and that would work with uh, Visual Studio 2013, and that would give you some new project types. But uh, this is quickly becoming obsolete. You can also pull in the Roslyn DLLs with NuGet. So if you go out to NuGet and just search for Microsoft.CodeAnalysis, uh, you'll see a couple different packages and they're broken out by uh, whether or not you just want everything, whether or not you just want C Sharp, whether or not you just want VB, um, whether or not you want the workspace API, APIs included, things like that. Uh, but what is becoming more and more prominent, uh, even this week, is just getting Visual Studio 2015. If you have the Visual Studio 2015 release candidate installed, uh, you will have some of these projects built in if you have the Visual Studio 2015 SDK installed, the Visual Studio SDK, uh, you'll have some additional templates. And in that point, you will actually be using Visual Studio or you'll be using Roslyn as the compiler. If you just pull in the, the NuGet packages um, in Visual Studio 2013, you'll be still using the compiler that you've been using for years. Uh, but you'll have access to um, a different compiler, the Roslyn compiler. So let's look at what that would look like. So this is Visual Studio 2013. And I have installed with NuGet the Microsoft.CodeAnalysis um, APIs. The Microsoft.code analysis uh, DLLs are really what represent Roslyn. And what I want to do is I want to I want to parse a file and I want to be able to list out all of the methods that are in it. And also, just for kicks, I'll also print out the class name. So I have a C sharp file that we will use as our test file. Here it is. Uh, it happens to be the solution to problem nine on projectoiler.com, um, in case you're wondering. But there's nothing terribly special about this. Uh, but you can see there is a main method and uh, binary search for solution, find the right B, which finds the value for B. Uh, 
it's not really that important. Uh, I don't know how to do it really quickly in Vim. So just, just trust me that uh, these methods are here. If, if you really want to see it, uh, I can show it to you later. But we have much more interesting things to get to. This is the code we care about. Can you read that? Better? All right. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to open this file called euler9.cs. And then I'm just going to read it as a string. I'm going to get the whole thing as a string. And then where we get into the Roslyn part of the code is there is this class inside of the Microsoft.code analysis namespace uh, called C sharp syntax tree. And I'm going to say parse text, which will give me the abstract syntax tree for that CS file. Uh, I'll ask for the root of the tree, which will give me a syntax node for the root. And then uh, I will have this query to get the class node. So I'll say root.descendant nodes of type class declaration syntax. I just want the first one in case there are multiple classes in the CS file. And I'm just going to do a console.write line on the identifier for that class. So I'm going to write that out. And then I just want to print out all the method declarations. So I'll say first class, descendant nodes of type method declaration syntax. I'll convert it to a list. And then I will just for each on the list and write out the method identifier. And then of course I have the boilerplate at the end that uh, uh, just says pressing a key to continue. So if I run this and kick up the font, can I not go any? Bigger? That's disappointing. That's terrible. All right. So, sorry, that's not bigger. You have to take my word for it again. Uh, but what you can see here is that with fairly few lines of code, we have used the Microsoft provided parser, picked out the class, picked out the method declarations, and uh, you know done some really simple analysis of the C sharp file, you know all in 40 lines. And of those 40 lines, maybe 10 of them are interesting. So hopefully, what that demonstrated was this is not that complicated. And that was using the NuGet packages. So um, we were analyzing a file outside of Visual Studio there. So this code analysis is the part that I'm most interested in. In that really simple example, we were able to analyze a file and just pick out the names. We could do some other interesting things like uh, just pick out the public methods. Maybe we just want to see what the API into that file looks like. Um, we could do some things with visualization. I'm a, uh, I work for a consulting company, so I'm brought in often as a consultant or some kind of contractor and get to work on code bases that I didn't write. And so a lot of times to do my job effectively, it's paramount that I come up to speed on a code base very quickly. I need to be able to grok what's going on in this code uh, very quickly, very efficiently. And so I'm very interested in being able to visualize the code base because I need to know where the interesting parts are so I can dig in really quickly. So this visualization piece is very interesting to me. And then the other thing is a lot of times I want to be able to programmatically come into a code base and improve it. I want to be able to do some refactorings. Um, since like Visual Studio 2015, or 20, 2005, 10 years ago, we've had this refactor menu. And it's had these same six refactorings in it. Now, there are third-party tools like ReSharper 
that are very popular that extend to this, but what would be really nice would be to have uh, smaller modules, maybe, you know, uh, not the whole kit and caboodle with ReSharper, but just, you know, some things that are either specific to me or specific to the code base I'm working in. And Rosalind actually gives us an API to create more refactorings. Uh, we won't look at it today, but I could create my own refactorings and they would show up right in that list, which is pretty cool. Um, and we'll get, we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, diagnostics in a little bit. But let's say that we wanted to uh, do some of this analysis. The first thing that we need to understand is a little bit more about this abstract syntax tree. So let's, let me pull up the right solution here. And let's generate a tree view of the abstract syntax tree for that same file we were just looking at, Euler9.cs. Oh, let me set the right solution to be the startup project. Oh, that should have worked. Hmm. So I've got this tree view on the left here. And you can see that the root of my abstract syntax tree is a compilation unit syntax node. And if we look at the contents of that, you can see that that represents the entire file. Um, underneath of that, we have these using syntax nodes, and there's a namespace syntax node. And underneath that, that represents my class declaration. And so over here on the right, you can see the contents, and I'm now down to just the contents of the class. If I drill in further, you can see I've got a, some method declaration syntax nodes. If I drill into that, I've got this block syntax. And inside of that, I've got an if statement. So you can see over here on the right, if I drill all the way into this if statement, I'm just now seeing the part of the code that is represented in that if statement, including the, SL if, or the else ifs and the else statements. So if we look at how this, is, this code is working, when the analyze button is clicked, I'm dropping into this uh, case, or the switch statement. And we'll switch on the file extension. And we'll get the root of the, what we'll call parse text, and then we'll get the root and then we'll call add node to tree. And what's worth noting about this is it's actually the same method for the c -sharp file and the VB file. That's because the base class of the abstract syntax tree is actually shared between VB and c -sharp. There are obviously different compilers, but where they can, they share an API. Where they can, they share data structures. So that a lot of this works between the two languages, which is pretty nice for writing tools because in, you could imagine how quickly you could have multiple languages selected. So we look at this add node to tree. You can see what we're doing is we're taking the, the node and we're just going to add we're gonna grab the type, and we'll get the, the full text of the node, which represents all of the code that's in there. And then we'll just add this to the visual tree. This, the, uh, the parent here is the items control. And then what we'll do for the node is we'll loop through all of its child nodes and add those to the tree, uh, passing in the current node as its parent. And so we're just kind of uh, recursively working our way down through the tree, building up the tree that we're seeing on the right. And so if we look at this for 
another file. You can see I've got this, I built up this visual tree over here on the left. And there are more using statements in this file. There's a class declaration syntax. There's a method, and I can you know, look at this method declaration syntax. Or this one. And again, I can drill in and you know, the method has a block, which the block declaration syntax just represents the part of the code represented between curly braces. And I could drill into the for each. And you would get very specific information. One of the things that's important to know about the abstract syntax tree is that each different type of syntax in C sharp has a type defined for that type of syntax. So if I want to get the for statements, I just have to find the for each or the for statement syntaxes. Does anyone notice anything interesting about this method we're looking at here? I realize it's hard to read in the back. Anyone recognize this method called add node to tree? Yeah, this is, <laughs> yeah. The reason that I titled this talk uh, C Sharp Inception is that there's a lot of these moments like this. This program that we're running right now is analyzing its own source code, right? Because Roslyn is a compiler and because it's open source, we could use Roslyn to compile itself. So there are a lot of these fun inception moments when you get to work in this. You know, I have, we can also have methods named analyze method and fields named field and, you know, stuff like that really amuses me as I work with this. I'm probably alone in that. So if you only remember one thing from this talk, this is what I want you to remember. In the same way that unit tests allow us to test code with code, Roslyn allows us to understand code with code. The thing that makes unit tests as powerful as they are is they allow us to ensure quality using our core competency, which is writing software. Roslyn allows us to use that same core competency to do analysis on the code. It allows us to understand the code. It allows us to generate information from the code. And so that's what I think makes it really powerful. And there's a lot of really neat opportunities for that as we'll continue to see as we go along. One other thing that's worth noting about that abstract syntax tree structure, there are three child types of the syntax that are inside the syntax tree. There are the syntax nodes. That's kind of what we're just looking at there. Things like the for statement declaration syntax, the method declaration syntax, the if statement declaration syntax. There are also syntax tokens. These are the things that kind of generate the ceremony around the C Sharp languages, uh, having to declare types, um, the actual keywords, the semicolons and the braces, those types of things. And then there's also syntax trivia nodes. Trivia nodes are white space and comments. And so you might ask why are those things included in the abstract syntax tree? Well, remember, one of the things that we're really interested in doing is being able to refactor code, or in some cases do analysis on it. And if we're gonna refactor code, we want to be able to take the comments with us and we want the formatting to be the same, so the white space is important. And so one of the things that they were very careful about when they designed Roslyn is to make sure that the abstract syntax tree was full fidelity with the code. So everything that's in the code is in the syntax tree. So when we want to move code around, all the comments come with it. All right. So let's look at another sample here. Let's say that we wanted to do some visualizations of our code. Let 
one of the things, and this is actually something I use on a somewhat regular basis already, is sometimes I just want to have a visualization of I'm coming to a class for the first time and I want to know what are the public methods, what are the public fields, what are the private fields, what are the properties. So I want to generate a visualization that would allow me to you know, just have this grid view and see, you know, broken out by field type and by protection level or by accessibility level, what are all the members of this class? And so in this case, we're analyzing a file called method one, or it's got public methods, method one, method two, and then private methods, method 1A, method 1B, method 2A, and method 2B. To generate this, you know, I'm just going through the, uh, some of the same steps we were looking at earlier. where I am parsing the text of the code file and generating a syntax tree. And I'm getting the root and I'm using it as the compilation unit. And to get the first class file, again, I'm doing that same thing where I'm just saying uh, root.members.first to get the namespace. And I'm saying, uh, give me the members and I'll take the first one because I just want the first class. This visualization assumes that there's, a, or we're only going to display the first class. Because you really should only have one class per C-sharp file anyway. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break out all of the fields, or all the members of the class based on their type. So to get the method nodes, I'll just say root.descendant nodes of type invocation expression syntax, so that's the method calls. Uh, if I want to get the method declarations there of this method declaration syntax, I can also get the fields and the properties. Yes, thank you for reminding me. So here's the, you know, to get the property nodes. Uh, we're just selecting all the nodes that are these uh, property declaration syntaxes. And then to break that out by their modifier, their access modifier, I can just write a simple link query. Because one of the things that's really nice about the abstract syntax tree is that it supports iQueryable really well. So I can have these link queries that give me the information I wanna see. So I have this property I declared earlier called property nodes, and I can just say, Give me the property nodes where the property declaration syntax modifiers dot any has the C sharp kind of public keyword. And so anything that's declared as public, I can return this property. And so going through this for all the different member types, I can break out and get the public, the private, and the protected members of all the methods, properties, uh, fields and events, and that's how I'm generating that information. Now the next thing that I want to visualize are the method calls. So I want to look at a C-sharp file and see where is a method defined and where is it being called. And in this case, we'll just look at that inside of a single file. And so you can see in this visualization, if you imagine the C-sharp file down the left here, here is where the method is being called and here's where it's defined. So method one has a method call to method 1A and method 1B. Now what's important about this visualization is we've now gone beyond just syntax. When I I can use the abstract syntax tree to find where these methods are defined. But to know that a specific method definition is mapped to a specific method invocation, 
requires us to go one step further in the compilation process. So we now have to actually generate the symbol information. We need to get more semantic information. Because sometimes when we do this, we have to go through method overloading, right? We have to resolve which one of the method overloads is being called. And so to do that, we're actually going to uh, get into these symbols and use the symbol API. To do that, I have another class here to, um, called semantic analyzer. So the semantic analyzer is gonna give us semantic information, not just structural information. I can try. So if I, all right, so we're still good. All right, how's that? All right. So the important part of this is this code here where we're going to actually take the C-sharp compiler one step further. And now we're going to use the C-sharp compilation class and we're gonna create a compilation. To do that, we need to do the things that a compiler would need to do. We need to be able to add our references. This is essentially what we're doing in Visual Studio when we have a project and we right click and say add references. So for this class, I made it simple. So we only need the MS core lib or system. And I'm gonna add the syntax tree that I generated earlier. Now to use this, I can use that semantic model to go from the method call syntax that we got earlier, and we're gonna get the symbol info for that. So now what I can do is I have this method call symbol, and it maps not just the fact that I'm calling a method, it's actually getting the symbol for the method that's called. So like I said, it's, it's bound those two things together has gone through the process of doing whatever overload resolution needed to be done, and we're good. From that point, I am getting the location and storing that, and then I'm using those locations later to draw those call arcs. So, any questions so far about the abstract syntax tree or, or the symbols? The good thing is that there's an easier way to do this. Uh, because in Visual Studio 2015, Roslyn will be the compiler, there are APIs that we can tie into where we actually don't have to generate our own abstract syntax tree. We can just tie into the syntax tree that is being generated um, by Studio. And this is where we're gonna do the things like the refactorings or uh, what we'll sometimes, or what are called code fixes with diagnostics. In simple terms, a diagnostic is anytime we have 
some kind of squiggly from Visual Studio. So we can have information, we can have warnings, uh, we can have errors, and we get the little squigglies wherever the code goes. What we can now do in Visual Studio 2015 with Roslyn is generate our own squigglies. That's technical term. So let's say that we wanted to have code where, that we wanted to have an error in Visual Studio if there was a try block followed by a catch block that was empty. It's pretty bad practice. We could actually write a code diagnostic that would find that and report it as a warning or possibly an error. Um, and we could, we could come up with our own rules. Again, this is not changing the syntax uh, like we were talking about earlier. It's just enforcing rules on our code with the compiler. The other cool thing is that we can create diagnostics or code fixes where we can actually fix that code. So right now in Visual Studio, if you click the little light bulb or hit control period, you'll often get a code fix. So if I have a type that Visual Studio thinks is undefined, I can click on the light bulb or click control dot. And sometimes it will say, just add a using for this namespace. And I click on that and it adds the using and the compiler error goes away. I can now create my own code fixes to resolve these issues. So in the case of uh, the empty catch block, we could have a diagnostic that finds the empty catch block, and we could have a code fix that inserts a throw statement in there. So we could resolve that really easily. Now the, the first example we'll look at is a situation that comes up sometimes in code bases I work in, mostly with my students, where they will have created a variable named foo, and they'll leave it in there. And so I need to have a code diagnostic that will find that. So of course we need to have something that fights foo. So to create a, a diagnostic, we'll come into my Visual Studio 2015 preview. And I have the Visual Studio SDK installed, which means that I can come in and say new project. And there'll be this template category for extensibility. And I can say diagnostic with code fix. So this is what I did. But I've already done that. And when you do that, you get some boilerplate code. And it looks kind of like this. So let me, let me show you what this does, and then we'll talk through the code. As with any Visual Studio extension project, what happens when you hit debug is it launches a second version of Visual Studio with your extension running. So you can see I've got this method named foo here, and I'm getting a green squiggly for it. And when I hover over that, it gives me a helpful warning that says, hey, dummy, don't use foo as a variable name, or in this case, a method name. So let's look at what it took to create that. I've got some boilerplate code up here at the top to give it a name and a title and that kind message name. Um, and then I'm gonna create a rule. The rule is kind of the unit of work for uh, displaying things through the compiler warnings. And then very importantly, I have some code here in the initialize method where I'm going to say I want to register a symbol action. Like I said, when I'm using the diagnostics and the code fixes, I'm not running my own compilation like I showed earlier when I use NuGet packages. I'm tying into the compilation that Visual Studio is doing. And so what I'm saying is I want to have a method called whenever the compiler encounters this type of symbol. 
Uh, there's another method on context uh, called register syntax action. So I could have a method called whenever uh, it encountered a certain syntax type. So all I'm doing here in my analyze method is I am saying, uh, I, because I registered for a method symbol kind, I know it's an I method symbol. And so I'm just gonna look at that and if the name, that two lower equals foo, I'm gonna create a diagnostic and I'm gonna report it. And so that, I'm gonna pass in the name, and I'm gonna pass in its location. This is what Visual Studio is gonna to use to display that compiler warning. Now, if we wanted it to be an error, we would, up here when we're creating the rule, we would just change the diagnostic severity to error. So we could do that. So in not a lot of lines of code here, we generated an admittedly simple uh, diagnostic. Now, what's more interesting is I want to be able to have a code fix. And so, I'm gonna register a code fix that will generate a better name. And so there's this boilerplate code that comes with the template where I can uh, compute the fixes. And I'll register this fix with my diagnostic. And so when it finds a token that we're talking about, it will call my code fix. Now in this case, you know, because the diagnostic is just finding variable name foo, it's uh, not exactly easy to find a better, to replace it with a better name. But there is one way we can make it a little bit better. So again, I've got this diagnostic that says, hey, dummy, don't use foo as a variable name. And if I click on the light bulb, you can see it says, uh, give it a better name, which is the name of my code fix. And if I click on that, it will replace it with Fanny Dorf Jangle Clank, which is way better than foo. If I wanted to, I actually, copied this off of the Benedict Cumberbatch funny name generator, and I could screen scrape it so I had a different one every time. Now one thing that I do want to point out is that when I run the code fix, it's kind of hard to read, but you can see it's showing me here, you know, here's the line of code I'd be fixing, and here's what I'm replacing it with. And I'm getting red squigglies there. Now what's really interesting about this is that what Visual Studio is doing is it's taking my code fix and generating a new abstract syntax tree with my, with my fix applied and compiling it. And so it's actually generating uh, a compiler error against code that I haven't even applied yet. So it's pretty cool that Roslyn can like tell you you don't want to change it to that because in that version of the code you'd have a compiler error. Now, uh, today at lunch, uh, some of us were talking and a guy named Seth said, hey, how hard would it be to write a diagnostic that would look for switch statements that didn't have defaults. And specifically, what if we were switching on an enum? And so, against my better judgment as a presenter, uh, we, d we wrote it, and now I'm gonna show it to you. But the, what I hope you take away from this is I was able to put this together uh, you know, just over lunch four hours ago, three hours ago. And it ended up not being that hard. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to uh, register a syntax node action on the syntax kind of switch statements. 
And when that happens, we'll call this analyze switch statement with enum method. And some of this code is a little tricky to talk through, but you know, it's only 20 lines of code or less. And so I'm gonna find that switch statement syntax. I am going to use this line of code, line 48, to pick out the identifier inside the switch statement. And I'll use this line to get the semantic model, right? Because it's, I need to go from having a variable in a switch statement to knowing what variable that is and what its type is. And in this case, I don't know if what its type kind is. So I'm just gonna say uh, if the type kind is type kind enum. And then to find out if there's a default in my switch statement, I'll just take the switch statement and ask for descendant nodes of type default switch statement syntax. And if it's uh, greater than zero, then we know that default exists. If not, then we're gonna create a diagnostic. So if we run this, we'll watch another version of Visual Studio. And I have a method down here that has two switch statements. And this first one is switching an int. And it's got no default, and it's not a compiler error. The second one is switching an enum. And if I comment this out, once the compiler has a chance to run, you can see I'm getting a syntax error. And I'm getting a kind message that says, please include a default case in the switch statement. And if I hadn't been so interested in Matt's talk earlier, I might have actually gotten the diagnostic done that would add the default in there. Uh, sorry, Matt, I was too entertained. But you could see how it wouldn't be too far to then go through and add this, a diagnostic for this. So I sometimes will get asked, what's my favorite thing about Roslyn? Why am I so excited about it? Because really it is just a compiler and we've had compilers for C-sharp before. But what I hope you take away from this talk is that there's a lot of cool things that as a community we could do. And it took me half an hour or 45 minutes to write that switch statement analyzer. Um, and that really could be useful. Uh, you know, the reason we started talking about it was uh, someone had a case where they needed that for a project they were on. And so I'm really excited to see uh, what we'll build. I hope that you guys are inspired. I hope that you guys go out and create some diagnostics. I hope you create visualizers. You know, I hope that we create tools that we can use for each other. We spend most of our time writing tools for other people. That is, in fact, what we do professionally. And so I'm excited to see how we can build tools for each other quickly and easily and make each other more productive. All right, any questions? Yeah, I didn't think so, we're right. Oh, I do get one. So one of the things that was in one of the early betas uh, was custom completion providers, which had to do with IntelliSense. Um, it doesn't look like that's gonna be in the, it's not in the re release candidate for Studio, so, or for Studio 2015. So probably, I mean, you could easily imagine a way that would be there in the future, but not this version. Yeah. The performance of Rosalind? The performance right now is on par with the current C-sharp compiler, which is impressive because the current C-sharp compiler is written in C++, and uh, this one is written in, the new one is written in C-sharp. Uh, they've made performance a priority, and you know, it was a little bit slow on my machine today because at one point I was running five versions of Visual Studio. Hey, that's fun. Um, 
the performance is generally pretty good. All right. Thanks for coming out. I will put this code up on uh, GitHub as soon as I have a chance to make sure that nothing was broken by the announcements at Build this week. Uh, and I will create some blog posts around it for the same reasons. Thanks for coming out. It was fun. <laughs>